Good morning, church family. It's wonderful to be able to meet with you once again, even though we might not be in person. We're lucky to have been able to get some people back to church, and it's been absolutely fantastic for us to be able to meet. But be aware that while we are meeting, those of you who can't be with us are in our thoughts and definitely in our prayers. So stay strong and be strong and know that we are missing you here at church. We're going to carry on with this morning's service as per normal, and we'd like to ask Helen to lead us in prayer. Mighty, everlasting Father, we bow down before your throne of grace and mercy. We bless your holy name, and we surrender our praise to you, our loving King. You are our creator and sustainer. Every good and perfect gift comes from you. You are our good shepherd, and you know and love each of us, despite our continual failings. How privileged we are to be able to call you Father. Dear Lord, we don't know what the future holds, but we do know that you are our rock and our fortress. You are our shield and our strong tower. Help us to anchor ourselves to you today. Teach us how to stand strong in you and choose only your way today. Help us to walk by your truth and not our feelings. Help us to keep our hearts pure and undivided. Protect us from our own careless thoughts, words and actions. Help us to embrace difficulties that come our way as an opportunity to see you at work and as an opportunity to point others to you. Lord, please will you help us to keep our eyes fixed on you and your amazing power and work in our lives. We find it very easy to complain about how difficult things are. But you tell us in your word that we must rejoice in trials as they produce endurance, character, and hope. And that hope does not put us to shame because your love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. In Hebrews, you promise to never leave us nor forsake us. Help this to be a firm anchor to our souls. Thank you that we can depend on you and trust that your promises are true. Thank you that you love us, and that nothing can ever separate us from your love. Even when we fail and fall short, you whisper your unconditional love deep into our souls, and remind us that your mercies are new every morning. Thank you, Lord. That is truly so much more than we deserve. Thank you, Lord, for your sacrifice on the cross, so that we might have forgiveness and life. Forgive us when we don't thank you enough for who you are, for all that you do, and for all you have given. Forgive us for our sinful words and deeds, and the good deeds that we have left undone. Help us to set our eyes and our hearts on you afresh. Renew our spirits, and fill us with your peace and joy. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Our reading today comes from Luke chapter 15, verse 11. The parable of the prodigal son. And he said, There was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is, com that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into his field to feed the pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, 
and bring the fattened calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has full has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you, and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. And when the son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It is fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. This is the word of the Lord. Morning, my family. I hope you're well. And it's been good that some of you have popped in and have been part of the church service on Sunday morning, and some of you haven't, and we really look forward to the time where we can see you. We miss we miss all of you. We'd love to see you. But again, you must come only when you feel safe to come. We will continue to pray for you. And uh, we would continue to bring God's word to you every Sunday. And thank you to my Bible study leaders for the wonderful job they're doing uh, midweek with Zoom Bible studies. If you're not part of it, please do. Um, Check with Jill in the office and be part of our Bible studies that are taking place during the week. Won't you please bow your heads and pray with me. Father, our hearts are prone to wonder. And so often the grass looks much greener on the other side. We pray this morning that you would help us to re-look at our lives, to re-evaluate our relationship with you and our commitment to you, not as our provider, but as our God. In Jesus' name, amen. My brothers and sisters in Christ, this morning we're doing the last of the three short series, which we've called Reset and Return to the Lord. And reset, obviously meaning repent and return to the Lord. So remember, the first one was really that of Zechariah, when God spoke to his people through the prophet Zechariah. And he used the example of the forefathers, the ancestors of Zechariah's generation, who didn't listen to him and did not take the warning when God said to them, Repent and come back. And if you don't, I will remove my protective hand and you will be invaded. And many of you would end up in exile. And they didn't listen. And they ended up in exile. And the sad part of it is that it was only when they were in exile that they realized the error of their ways and repented of their sins. By then, it was too late in terms of saving them from exile. But God continued to be with them even in exile and eventually returned his people back home in Israel. Then in the second sermon which we took from the book of Joel. In that generation, God had blessed his people. Life was good. The crops were in abundance. The animals were increasing in number. And life was so good. And people enjoyed life. And the sad part of it is that in the process of enjoying life, they actually forgot the God who provided all those things for them. And then God allowed the plague of locusts to come and destroy their fields. And that posed a real threat 
both to their livelihoods and their lives. This was a great community. And without fields, they were in trouble. So while they were trying to make sense of the plague, God sent his prophet Joel to tell them that that was just the warning. They need to repent and return to him. And God will continue to protect them. And indeed, in this morning, we are looking at one of the most famous parables in the Gospels. And the parable of the prodigal son. We know the story very well. And Jamie read the passage for us, which is Luke chapter 15, from verses 11 to 32. In this par par parable, Jesus tells the story of the family. It's just a typical family. We told that it was a father who had two sons, and dad must have worked with his sons in the field, and they were a family. But the younger son had another plan. He wanted to enjoy life. And every time he looked at his dad, his dad looked fresh and strong and there were no signs of aging and dying. And so he decided to go to his father and said, Dad, I know that you will leave something for me when you die, as it were. But can I have it while you're still alive? Can I have my share of the inheritance? And the Bible doesn't even tell us more about the discussion between dad and the son. Why do you want to do this, son? I'm not going to do this, son, because we've worked hard for this. We're not told all that. All we're told is that the father gave his son the inheritance that he had requested. Well, it wasn't long after receiving the inheritance that the son began to pack up all that belonged to him. And then he said to his father and to his brother, Cheers, guys. I'm going away to enjoy my life. He left. And of course, he went to a country far away. We're not even told that, that country. But in our modern language, let's say he went up and he spent his, 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 some time somewhere in South Africa. Let's call it Sun Coast. He booked himself a five-star room there. And my goodness, he threw a part of his life time. There were friends there. There were girlfriends there. Life was good. He was a famous man. And everything was on him. Everybody loved him. Everybody thought great about this guy. And it wasn't long. What he had freely received disappeared. Easy come, easy goes. He wasted everything, squandered it, and then he, was, he found himself broke. And what made things worse, Jesus says, in the midst of all that, there was severe famine in the land. There was definite and shortage of food and resources in the area. And he was broke. And he was a stranger in the foreign land. So what he did, he began to really just push his CV around trying to find a job. And jobs were hard to come by. Pretty much like at the moment, it is so hard for people who are looking for jobs to push your CV during COVID. It's so difficult. So the young man couldn't find a good job. He ended up with such a demeaning job of feeding pigs. And that was a terrible job for a Jewish man, feeding pigs. But that was the job that was available for him. And Jesus, as he continues to tell the story, this man, seeing firsthand that the pigs were actually having more food than what he had, it hit him. He realized that he had made a very, very bad decision. Did you see that in verse 17? Jesus says, But when he came to himself, he said, 
How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger and I will rise. I will arise and I'll go to my father. He came to his senses and then he pressed that reset button. I made a mistake. I find myself in this mess. I can't go on with this. I've got to start. I've got to start afresh. And he pressed the reset button. Said, I will arise and I will go back to my family. I have a home. I have a father. I have a brother. I have a family. I made a horrible decision when I chose the sinful pleasures of a dad's love and affection. I'm going back. You see, at this point in time, this young man, he, he had to swallow his pride. He had to take responsibility for his irresponsible decision. He says, I will go back to my dad and I will apologize you see that? I will say to my father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. Dad, I abused your love. I abused your support. I took you for granted. I took the whole family for granted and I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Even though you did so much for me and my brother, I still treated you like dirt. And dad, I'm sorry. And this is the man, he's rehearsing this alone. That's what he's going to tell dad when he gets home finally. But I want us to pause for a moment and look at it. You see, this is True repentance. The young man admits that he, he sinned. He doesn't blame anybody for his sins. It's not my brother who treated me bad and that's why I left home. It's not dad, you didn't treat me fairly and you pushed me away from home. No, no. He's not blaming anybody. He takes full responsibility for his irresponsible decision. I have sinned. And I am not worthy of your love and affection. Full responsibility. See, my brothers and sisters in Christ, that is the struggle many people face. We don't want to take responsibility for our decisions. Many people, and they make bad decisions. They blame circumstances. They blame parents. They blame education. They blame upbringing. It's everybody else's mistake, but not mine. I'm just a victim of circumstance. And this man says, it's not anybody's mistake. It's my mistake. I made that mistake. It's not everyone else. It's me. And until we get to that situation where we take full responsibility for our decisions, we'll never get out of our wayward ways. God has blessed us abundantly but how many of us are enjoying god's blessings without god how many of us have taken what god has given us and we've walked away into a far distant land and god doesn't see us anymore and when we sit and we ask ourselves 
Why have I not been to church for the last two years? And we supply all sorts of external circumstances. It's work. It's children. It's the husband. It's wife. It's everybody else but not me. Until you take full responsibility for your lack of commitment uh, to God's call, you will continue to remain where you are. And this man, he took full responsibility. And then in verses 20 to 24, which is my second point, he returns home. It was his decision that led to his predicament. And he was going to make the right decision and return back home. Yes, he might have bent all the bridges, but who knows, maybe God, as Joel said last week, who knows, maybe God would forgive and bless you, return to him. And this man must have learned some of those lines from the Old Testament that dad had taught him. He was going to go back home. He got up, he dashed himself off, and he embarked on this journey back home. Probably he rehearsed these lines of forgiveness that he would share with his dad, but he had no idea how his father would respond. His prayer was just simply this, that his father may not reject him. That his father may not say to him, go back to where you come from. He came. And the Bible tells us that while he was still far away, his father saw him. The Bible says he felt compassion and he ran to him. He embraced him and he kissed him. The father sees his son. Oh my God. That looks like my son. He must have wiped his eyes again. And looked. And looked. And he realized. No, no, no. It's, it, his eyes are not playing up with him. It's his son. And he took off. And he ran to him. And when you read this passage. It's very clear he wasn't even going to listen to his son. And his son says, Dad, Dad, I, Dad, I have sinned against you. Dad, Dad, Dad just hugs his son, holds him and he says, My son, it's good to see you. Stinky as he probably was. His father looked beyond that and saw his son who was dead but now alive. He took him home. They walk back home and his servants, they see, hey, he's back. And the father is so happy. I mean, the smile is right up to there. He says to his servants, my son is back. Get the fattened calf. Please, let's have the party. Let's celebrate. He's back. And they had a great celebration. And life was good. Dad was happy. The son was relieved. And home was warm. And food was plenty. And love was readily and freely available for him. Father, I have sinned. And Father says, my son, welcome home. And then Jesus really says, this is how it will be with God when a sinner repents of his sin and turns to God for salvation. God throws a big party and heaven celebrates. So when you hear this message and the Holy Spirit convicts you of your sin, and you press that reset button and you choose to come back home, God will throw up a big party for you. 
He's waiting for you to come home. If you could only humble yourself and come back to him. My brothers, earthly pleasures, they're just earthly pleasures. And you will not take anything with you. Earthly pleasures will not last. Comfort, convenience, and self-reliance are only enjoyable for as long as God grants you good health to enjoy. You may have the most beautiful home and the most luxury car and the great yacht, but if you are unwell and you're stuck in a hospital, all that count for nothing. Now God says to you this morning and to you, press that reset button. Repent of your sins. Return home. The father welcomed his son and God will welcome you. He will embrace you. He will accept you. No matter how sinful you may have been. Jesus doesn't undermine the gravity of the young man's sin. He embarrassed his father. He embarrassed his family. He, he, he literally, you know, just abused them all to get what he wanted. Jesus doesn't undermine that. But what Jesus does, he, he raises up the stake in that. He says, God forgives even that. Because the Father in this picture represents God. And this Son represents so many sinners out there in the world who may feel rejected by the world. And some of them feel beyond God's grace. Well, the parable says, no one is beyond grace, not even you. If you repent of your sins and come back, God will forgive your sins and will take you home. My last point, the twist. And the twist starts from verse 25 to 31. In the parable, it's, here's the father with the son. They're dancing and it's wonderful. It's great. The son is back and the son is maybe a little bit embarrassed, but he's dancing with his father. And the dad is just so happy. And the music is loud. Obviously, they, they didn't live in the suburbs. Because then the, sub, the neighbors would phone the police and complain. They were somewhere in the township and life was great. And the son comes. He comes home and he hears the music. He's like, wow. What's up with dad today? He calls for one of the servants and the servants come and he says, your brother, your brother is back and your dad is so happy. Come, come, let's go. And he turns and he's angry. He's so angry that he actually doesn't even want to walk in. He refused to come home. He refused to be part to take part in this celebration. And he's so angry that his father realizes something is wrong with my son. He goes out. You see, the father again, he went out to welcome the sinful returning son. And now he was out to encourage a loyal, reliable son, to come and celebrate with him. He begged him. He urged him. Come home. Read the passage. I mean, the words, it's just like, come. It is right we celebrate. Your brother is back home. And the son says, Dad, I have served you faithfully for all this time while he was away. And I don't remember not once you throwing a party for me. But here's the word. When this irresponsible and reckless son of yours, he doesn't even say my brother, he says son of yours, come home. You killed the fattened calf for me. 
He wasted your money and your resources. He squandered it. And you throw a pot? And the father says to him, Son, I can see him with his arms around him, with his arm around him, and he says, Son, all that is mine is yours. But it is fitting that we celebrate the return of your brother. And he doesn't even say my son. He says your brother. Your brother was dead and he is now alive. He was lost but is now found. See that? Did he go back? The parable doesn't tell us. It just ends there. We don't know if this, the, the son went and joined the, the, the party. But this we know. If he repented of his pride and arrogance and the feeling of entitlement, if he repented of that sin, he then went back and celebrated with his brother. But if he refused to repent of his sin, then he probably ended up outside. Which would be strange, isn't it? That the son who was at home ended up outside. The son who was away, he ends up inside the kingdom. Why is Jesus telling this parable? It was to the Pharisees, the tax collectors, the religious leaders, the scribes, the teachers of the law, and the prostitutes. Jesus wanted the religious leaders to understand that self-righteousness will not end them a place in God's kingdom. The whole parable aims at really showing them who was really lost here. The young man was lost in that he went away. But the other son was lost while he was at home. You see, the, the other son, the older son, the older brother, he loved his father for his money. And so he was annoyed that what he thought was his was now being shared with the younger brother. And yet the, par the parable, Jesus doesn't give all the details. It just it ends like that for us to make this decision. Will you repent of your sin? Come home. Be it the sin of running away from the Father or the sin of being religious and sticking around but actually not love God with your heart. And Jesus says, it will be like that for those who think they will earn God's kingdom by good works, like this man, the older brother. He, this is what it will happen to those who serve God for wrong reasons. God cannot be fooled. God knows your heart and my heart. He knows us. Maybe you're a son who is in a far distant land. And God is calling you today. He says to you, my daughter, come back home. We miss you. My son, come back home. We miss you. Maybe you the, you the son and the daughter who is at home. But your heart is not at home. God says, Rend your heart, not your good works. Because he wants to have that deep, intimate relationship with you. And so my brothers and sisters, as we wrap up this series, I hope you get the point that repentance, true biblical repentance, is both the mind and the heart. 
And that repentance leads to action. We go back home. And for those of us who are in a church whom God has given us strength to persevere, I hope you'll be gracious to those people you know who used to be Christians and they backslid. Let's not wait for them to come back home. Let's go out there and find them, encourage them, show them the love of Christ. Let's not judge them, but rather let's encourage them to come back home. The only place where we would find true joy is in God's kingdom. We know people who used to come to our church and they don't come anymore. And they don't go to other churches, they're sitting at home. They're like those sons who ran away. Let's go and find them and not be like the older brother who just couldn't be bothered about his brother. Let's go and find them, bring them home. Let's be of encouragement, my brothers and sisters, to those who used to walk with us in the Lord and lost their ways. The message is simple. God wants them home. Let's, let's work with them. Let's guide them. Let's encourage them. Let's walk with them as we guide them back May God grant you strength if you are making a decision to come home. I would love to talk with you. I would like to have coffee with you, pray together with you, and be of encouragement to you. Give us a ring. And you know someone who needs encouragement and you don't know how to go about to begin to Share the gospel with that person. Let's talk. And let's see how we can all get on board with God's mission. Bringing sons and daughters into glory. In Jesus' name. Let's pray. Father, many we know left home. Some left home thinking they would find a better place and they've realized they made a mistake but they're finding it difficult to go back home. Lord, please trouble their hearts enough for them to, to return home as you did with the prodigal son. And for many who left home thinking they'll come back. They just need to sort out one or two things. And they've been swallowed by the world and its trappings. Oh Lord, we pray that you would stir their hearts today and send them back home. And we thank you for your mercy and your promise that when a sinner returns, he is never rejected. We pray, Lord, that you would, you would help us who are walking with you to not just enjoy the blessings of walking with you, but also to have compassion for those who are away from your love and to go out of our way to seek them, to point them to Christ and to walk with them in Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.